maintain water and to keep him safe from cactus and other pokey things. So when you're here at the Wetland Center, stop by and say hi to Oink. Friends, when is a pumpkin not a pumpkin? When you decorate it, watch us. Hi guys, uh, Jeannie here with the Wetland Center and we are gonna teach you guys how to decorate some pumpkins. Now I have a friend with me, her name is Kaylee and she's one of the members here with our Epic Club, which if you haven't learned already is environment protectors um, initiating change. So she's gonna turn this pumpkin right here into a Cinderella's carriage. I hope that you're ready. Kaylee, are you ready? Yeah. So I'm gonna put my mask on. I'm gonna step to the side. So Kaylee's gonna start by adding blue paint to the pumpkin. This is gonna give her that beautiful base that Cinderella's carriage has. Oh, now Kaylee's adding some silver glitter, give it a little bit of sparkle, because what Disney princess doesn't need glitter? So the next step in making a Cinderella carriage is to add some sequins or jewels, whatever you have on hand. You could use Elmer's glue, especially if you're working with little kids, or maybe a hot glue gun. Oh, that's beautiful. I love all the sequins and the dazzling going on. I'm sure you could even use your jewels, your sequins, and make the door for Cinderella to go into. Really? Using paint and glitter and sequins is all about creativity. Let your mind create a picture and just go for it. If it doesn't look great, well, I'm sure it's beautiful. Everything we make is beautiful, right? There's no mistakes in art. So guys, we have Kaylee here again. She's gonna remind us what we use to make this beautiful uh, dazzling pumpkin in front of us. And can you show us what you use? Some paint, glitter, sequins, and tiny pumpkin. So that's it guys, all you need is a pumpkin, four tiny little pumpkins to make your wheels, some blue paint, sequins, and some glitter, and there you have it. Now, I'd like to thank Kaylee for coming out here and doing this for us. She was a little uncomfortable, but I think she did great. Now, elbows. Hey guys, so um, my name is Christy and I'm gonna show you how to turn this pie pumpkin into a spider. So first you're gonna need something to punch a hole in the side of your spider. And right here, I've punched four holes on each side for eight legs. The next thing we do is paint our pumpkin black. So you just wanna cover the pumpkin with some paint. And this is fun to let the kiddos do. It doesn't have to be totally perfect. They can use whatever color they want. So paint your pumpkin black, and then you get some pipe cleaners. And the pipe cleaners are gonna go where those holes you just punched in. And for our eyes, we have some spooky light eyes that uh, you will tape or hot glue to your pumpkin, right? The paint's wet. So you should probably let this dry a little bit. And some googly eyes because 
spiders have eight eyes, a pair of really big ones, and then a bunch of small ones. And then put your big eyes there, and you've turned a pie pumpkin into a spider. Hi everyone, Gina again. We are going to decorate this pumpkin using a drill and some string light. Now I've already um, kind of taken out most of my pumpkin, pumpkin guts and I still have my lid because we'll need that later. Remember it needs to fit back on top. I did cut off some of the bottom just to make it a little bit lighter and a little bit thinner. Um, so what I'm going to do now is you may have noticed that I've written the word epic on the front using a washable marker so I can wipe it off later. I'm going to use my drill and I'm going to drill holes. And in those holes, I'm going to be placing uh, these string lights so that we can actually read the words a little bit later. So here we go. So again, you want to have your drill and a drill bit and you're just going to start drilling holes where you want those lights to go. And you want it to go all the way through. So I'm going to keep doing that all the way around the letters here until I have them all done. So stay tuned. And the lines that you drew are just there as a guide. So let's say you start drilling into your pumpkin and you just really don't like the way that letter looked. You can always change it at this time. Maybe you have to shift your letters over a little bit or maybe you drew it too low. Right now we can change all of that. is really quick and easy. It doesn't take a whole lot of effort. I think the hardest part was actually the part I didn't show you where I cleaned out all those pumpkin guts. So I'm halfway done. I've done the E and the P. I'm moving on to my I now. And when I'm all done, I'll turn it around and show you. It's just going to look like a bunch of holes everywhere. But once you put those lights in, it's really going to look pretty cool. OK, so you'll notice it left some pumpkin guts all the way on the outside. But I've got a paper towel here, and I'm just going to wipe that off. Okay. I also used a washable marker so that when I took my uh, paper towel here, I can just remove all of it. You'll notice it also got all over my hand, but that's okay. So now we're going to take our string lights and we're going to poke them through each one of these holes and it's going to make the word epic illuminate. Um, so I'm just going to stick them in here and I like to start at the bottom. Oh. Technical difficulties. Let me use my drill one more time. I might have to make all of these holes a little bit larger. Or you can thin out the inside of your pumpkin. You would do that by scraping it, and I might actually have to do that. So I'm going to take my spoon here, and I'm going to scrape the inside of my pumpkin to thin it out just a bit so that it makes it a little easier for my lights to go through. I'm going to try that now before I clean my pumpkin. Because if it's not thin enough, I will have to do it again. Yep, but that looks like it's going to work. So I'm going to turn that around. I'm going to take my paper towel and I'm just going to wipe it, try and clean off some of those pumpkin guts. And you can use whatever color lights you want. I am using purple. That's what we had on hand, and I think it's very Halloween like. So, you're going to take your lights and you're going to poke them 
through the holes. This will take a little bit of time. And anytime you get to a spot and the pumpkin seems to thick, use your spoon and scrape it out. And there you have an E. Three more letters to go. So I'm finding that when I use this pin and I push all of that stuff out of the way, I can also widen the holes just a smidge by moving the pin in a circular motion inside of these drilled holes. And there we have it, friends. So if you had a bunch of extra lights, you could just stick them inside. I really don't. I'm just going to kind of sit my cap on top. And there you have it. You have made a sign on your pumpkin. Ours says epic. Well, because we're the epic club. We hope you guys enjoyed this section on decorating pumpkins. Now, we'd like to invite all of you to submit the way you decorate your pumpkins. So if you'd like, you can comment below and post pictures of your jack-o'-lanterns. We can't wait to see them. We hope you guys are having a great time here at Spooktacular and enjoy the rest of the show. Bye. Be careful and don't get lost in the caution tape maze. You start off by 30 points and if you knock them down, like when you, you touch it, it's minus one point, and if you knock it down, it's minus two points. So here we have the mad scientist going through. You notice there's no lab coat. That was one point, by the way. Oh! Oh, yeah. Oh, 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 oh. Not that, that hair, that COVID Does hair. Does this count? No. Oh my gosh, she is making it through with 29 points. You, you are a pillar B. We believe in you. You can do it. Oh, you're doing great, doing great. Okay, one point. Two points. Two. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, three, four. That's okay. Keep going. <laughs> That's all right. It's only four points. You got this. You're taking it with you. I don't blame you. If, you get, if it's going to get counted against you, you take it with you. All right. Good job. Let's see. Let's see if he leaves with only four points. Oh. All right. Wait, 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 oh, oh, with a total of 26 points, all right, this is how we usually end the game, there we go, we tear it on down, hey, one's left standing, uh oh, go back, get it, yeah, Woo! are you ready, are you ready? for the riveting reptiles. Greetings, Agent Swift again, with the FBI, the Federal Bureau of Information. I'm back with one of my favorite animals. Peter Bang called and said, there's a crocodile, it's spectacular, so I had to come see for myself. And look what I found. Is this a crocodile? No, I'm not a crocodile. Listen. No, he is not a crocodile. This is an American alligator. He's grunting because he wants to talk to. We don't have crocodiles here in Texas. We only have alligators. So if you see something in the wild, it's going to be an alligator. Why is he grunting like that? Well, yes, he wants his time on camera too. But usually in the wild, that means, mommy, come help me. So that's how brave these guys are. They call out for their mama to come and protect them. Let's take a look at this beautiful animal. This one is about a year and a half old. He looks pretty big. That's because he gets fed very, very well here at the Wellland Center. 
he gets chicken and he gets fish and he gets shrimp and he gets all kind of reptile pellets. So this guy's been kind of spoiled. May not be quite this big in the wild if he was trying to eat on his own. Let's take a look at his face. Hey, <laughs> does he want to be in the camera? I think he just wants to talk to the camera. Let's take a look at, I'm going to tuck him under my arm here so he doesn't try to get away. Let's take a look at his eyes. He actually has an extra set of clear eyelids that he can move up over his eyeballs to protect himself when he is hunting underwater. That would be so cool. It's like built-in goggles. I bet mad scientists would love something like that. He has about 82 teeth in that mouth. I don't really know if I want him to open his mouth, but he did it for us anyway. So you can take a look at those teeth that are shining in there. He has very, very, very strong bite around 2,400 pounds per square inch. So this guy has one of the strongest bites in all of uh, nature here in Texas. So we don't want to stick our hand in there because that would really hurt. But for now, he's being pretty good and letting me hold him. If he decided he wanted to get away, he could probably wiggle himself out because he's pretty strong already, even at just a year and a half old. Now, would I put this, this beautiful animal back out in the wild? No, unfortunately he will not go back into the wild because he's been raised by people and he is used to people feeding him. So he's gonna go live in a beautiful zoo once he leaves the wetland center. So if you wanna get a check, Take a look at these beautiful gators that they have here. Come on by and take a look. But for now, what are we going to say? Later, gator. Hey guys, mad scientist here. Now, I wasn't went in search of candy corn, but I, I didn't find any. But instead, I found my friend here. This is Ziggy. And Ziggy's a bearded dragon. Now, he was all dressed up for Halloween, so I thought I should show you. Check out that witch's head. Isn't he so cute? Now, Let's learn some facts about this guy. He's one of nine different species that can be found in Australia. So friends, are we gonna find them here in Baytown? Not outside. You might find one at your friend's house because they are found in the pet trade. Now, he also, like our snake friends, has some of those really rough, dry scales. Those help him to keep that moisture inside of his body because he lives in a really, really hot, dry place in the deserts of Australia. Now you'll notice he likes to just hang out on my shirt here. In the wild, they would live in trees and bushes and you know, try and get away from everything that's trying to eat him like a wombat or something. Now, Ziggy here is super duper nice, but when he gets upset, you might notice that he sticks out this flat pouch on his throat. Looks like a big giant beard and puffs his body up full of air. And these spikes that give him a dragon-like appearance, they're kind of hard and it hurts a little bit. Luckily, Ziggy, like I said, he's pretty calm all the time and doesn't do that very often, but he does like to turn his, his uh, throat a little bit black every once in a while. Now, Ziggy, would you like me to take your hat off? Yeah? Okay. Sometimes bearded dragons will even bob their heads up and down. I'm actually surprised he's not doing that for you today. That's one of Ziggy's favorite things to do. Maybe I can get you to say. No? When they do that, that's their way of communicating, often to show dominance in a situation. He likes to think he can boss me around, but you may be my lab partner, but I'm the boss around here. No? He seems unimpressed. What do you think? Does he look impressed? No, I didn't think so either. Now, Ziggy, He's an omnivore, just like we are. So he eats plants and he eats meat, but his meat looks, looks a little different. He likes to eat insects. Now, how many of you at home have tried bugs? <laughs> I have. I like to eat some of his favorite things sometimes, mealworms. Now, I like to eat the barbecue variety, you know, or cheddar. They're dehydrated. You can find them like on Amazon. Anybody else like Amazon at home? Yeah, we do. This guy though, he likes to eat them live. Now, normally, after an encounter like this, I'd place him on the ground and give him a couple of super worms, those icky, crawly little beetles like things. They're not beetles yet. And he likes to chomp them down with his nice, strong mandibles. Now, he is a lizard, so unlike our snake friend, who's also a reptile, he has four legs. And if we look closely at his head, he has ear openings. Snakes don't have that. 
Now he is on display here at the Wetland Center. So if you ever want to get a chance to meet Ziggy, your friend, you can schedule a birthday party and you'll get an up close interaction with this guy. And we hope to see you guys real soon. So see you later. Hi guys, and welcome back to Spooktacular Riveting Reptiles. I have a very riveting reptile with me right here, dressed up as a witch for Halloween. How cool is that? All right, he doesn't really like his costume. This is a baby box turtle. He's a three-toed box turtle because on his back legs, he has three toes. I'm very surprised that he's actually letting me show you his feet. And if you look very closely at his feet, you'll notice that there is a little bit of webbing because he likes to hang out in the water sometimes, not all the time. But what makes him a three-toed box turtle, besides his three toes, is his shell. At the top of his shell, his carapace, and the bottom shell is his plastron. And if you look, he's trying to look, right here on his plastron, that is a hinge that allows him to pull his legs and head completely into his shell and turn it into a box. That's how he gets away from predators or when he's very scared. He doesn't seem to be very scared now. He likes to eat mealworms, just like Ziggy. They share food sometimes, and vegetables, leafy greens. Every once in a while, he'll get blueberries as a treat. He's really cool, and he's a reptile. His shell is made out of bony scoots. Actually, it's the stuff that our fingernails are made out of, keratin, and it grows with him. He can never leave his shell. So when you see a turtle crossing the road, it's super important to always be safe, but help him along so that he doesn't get hit by a car. Hey, have you seen my slipper? I guess I have to keep looking. And finally, my friends, the med scientist will answer. What's glowing on? Welcome back, everybody, to the Med Scientist Lab. And Alex, I see you laughing. <laughs> so we are going to learn our last experiment of the day. And it has to do with something called luminescence. Any guesses on what that means? Well, if you thought it has to do with light, you're absolutely right. Now, there are three kinds of luminescence we learn about in science. There's chemiluminescence. So two different chemical compounds mixed together to make a light. Hey, Bob, can you get the lights for me? Absolutely. So if we take a glow stick and we break it and shake it up, we just made light. This is chemiluminescence. Can you turn the light back on, Bob? Absolutely. So inside of a glow stick, there is a glass tube. And that glass tube has a chemical, and around it, it has another one. And the hydrogen peroxide in here is going to mix with that light uh, illuminating compound and make light. Now, in our natural world, we have something called bioluminescence. And it's a form of chemiluminescence. Any guesses on what insects that we have, mostly during May in Texas, especially this part here? Hmm. If you thought about fireflies, you're right. So you can notice that there are different shades of light that we can make, and it just depends on the colors that are or the chemicals that we put inside of these tubes. So this one, let's see what color it makes. And it's purple. So we made blue, green, purple. Any guesses on the last one? If you guess yellow, you're right. So Bob, if you would turn off those lights one more time for me, I'm going to show them just how bright these are. Absolutely. Now when the chemical reaction is all over, it stops emitting light, and then they just go dark. Okay, so this is chemiluminescence, and we can find them in nature in things like fireflies. Fantastic. All right, Bob, lights back on, please. Another type that we have. It's called fluorescence. Now, fluorescence is where if you put a UV light, something like this black light, okay, I'm going to be using this and a handy-dandy little flashlight to show you this one. It's going to uh, show us things that make light using this UV uh, spectrum of color. 
So things that do this in nature are scorpions. Bob, lights please. I'm gonna try and put it a little closer to you. So here, you can see that the exoskeleton of the emperor scorpion is going to fluoresce. Now, the second I turn this off, it goes away. Again, we put it on, it fluoresces. So it has to have the UV light on it in order for us to see it. The animal that we have that fluoresces is the axolotl. So I'm gonna walk on over here. This animal has some really cool adaptations. Well, really, they were bred into this species and that allow them to kind of glow like this. And again, this is called fluorescence because if I turn the light out, it stops glowing. Turn the light back on. <gasps> And there it is. Now the other part on this guy, other than his tail that fluoresces, is his eyes. So, another animal that fluoresces is the bark scorpion. That green that we see in the bark of the log is the bark scorpion. Now if we were to turn on the lights, Bob, you can there still you slightly see it. And I'm going to turn the light off, and now he's brown. Turn the light back on, and now he's green. Turn the light back off, and now he's brown. What do you guys think now? <gasps> That's right, green. How cool is that? Fluorescence is amazing. It's not only animals that fluoresce, plants, well, not really a plant, kind of a symbiotic relationship, which means that they kind of work with each other to, well, you know, survive. This is a symbiotic relationship between a fungus and an algae called cyanobacteria. Now they help to break down rocks and stick and turn them into dirt. But if we look at them under UV light, they fluoresce just like our animal friends did. Are you ready to see it? Bob, thanks Bob. Now I'm going to hold this up and you're gonna see that this stick starts to glow purple. And that's not my black light doing that. I've got another one. Stay right there. Ooh, this one's covered in lichen. Now, the lichen kind of give it a purpley orange glow. Now, camera person, can you see that? Great, I'm so glad. Now, my friends, again, this is called fluorescent. It only works when the light is shining. Ooh, look at that one, that one's really cool. Do you see it? Perfect. This is, again, fluorescence. It only happens when the light's on it. Turn it off, no more glow. This is phosphorescence. It holds on to that glow long after the lights have been turned off. Now, we're going to do a little experiment. Bob, would you turn the lights back on for just a moment? Thank you, Bob. Yeah, so I appreciate you so much. So friends, we are going to use that pumpkin we made our slime in earlier, kind of clean it out, play with it for a bit. Then you can make it inside the pumpkin. I'm going to use this handy dandy Erlenmeyer flask just because it gives us a little bit more pizzazz. And we're gonna make a glow in the dark volcano. Now I'm gonna leave it out actually while we fill it up so you can see what I'm doing. The first step is that we're going to put baking soda. And we buy the jumbo size around here because, well, we use baking soda a lot. Now, I've got a funnel made from paper because I couldn't find my funnel today. It happens. You're welcome. Thanks, Bob. And you're going to put the baking soda into your Erlenmeyer flask, just like that. See it in there? This is called sodium bicarbonate. Now, this is a base. So whenever you think of bases, think about stuff that we wash our hands with, our clothes. Okay, those are gonna be bases. And if we were to look at them on something called the pH scale, which goes from zero to 14, they're gonna be on the higher end of that scale. So from eight to 14. Okay, so this is a base. Now we're gonna be pouring vinegar into it in a moment. And vinegar is an acid. Okay, now I put some here into my beaker so it's easier to pour. So we have baking soda, we have our vinegar, and for a sec, we're gonna put some soap, actually over here, just a little bit, makes the bubbles a little bit better. Then I'm going to make this a nice, awesome glow-in-the-dark experiment by putting fluorescent paint in there. I'm gonna start off with some pink because I like it, and I'm gonna mix it into, hmm, I'm gonna make a smaller batch so we can do more colors, isn't that exciting? So we got our vinegar, Ooh, 
smells great. And you're going to pour your paint. This is a pipette. You can use a spoon. This is just what I had. You're going to mix your fluorescent paint into your vinegar. Voila. Now, I'm going to show you what it looks like with the light on. Bop. And you'll notice that it glows in the dark. So, we are going to take a light. Thanks, Bob. Sorry. You're going to take your early minor flask. You're going to put it inside your pumpkin. And when you're ready, turn the lights out for some amazingness. And you're going to pour your vinegar in. When you do that, a chemical reaction occurs. Oh, that was less than a... Can you even see that, friends? Nope. Oh, man. We're going to do that again. This time, I'm just going to use the pumpkin. I'm going to put a ton of baking soda in. Now, I'm not being super scientific. I'm just going to pour a bunch because that's what I want to do. Pour the whole thing. That's too much, Bob. Bob told me to pour the whole thing. You didn't hear it, but he sure did. So, I've got some baking soda in there. Put a lot. Oh, there's still some slime on my pumpkin. Mmm. Okay. Then, I need more baking soda. Not baking soda, vinegar. I'm going to make a bigger batch of the paint. You'll notice that it falls to the bottom. That's because it's denser than the vinegar, but it dissolves in water. So it's going to mix in with our vinegar really, really well. All right, are we ready? Hopefully this one's better. It's going to be awesome. Lights. Camera. Action. <sighs> so much better. Can you see it over there, that cameraman? Can awesome. you see my amazing reaction? That. No? Do we need more fluorescent amazing. paint? I think we might. Or I have an idea. <gasps> yeah. Whoa. So we'll add a little extra UV light to our reaction here. Who wants to see it again? Me! I do. So we're just gonna pour that out. Just baking some of the vinegar. It's not gonna hurt you. Ooh, friends, I did something really, really bad. Anytime you do a science experiment, you should have your eye protection on, just in case. Now, this time, we're going to take some more baking soda. Put a bunch in. Pour some more Hmm. Thinking we should go with classic yellow, because why not? Why not? Pour the whole thing. And again, you guys gotta mix it in because that paint is denser than the vinegar. Watch it dissolve. It's mixing in. Ooh, it's kind of turning a little bit orange, pink and yellow. <gasps> wow. Now, we're gonna watch this. Oop, I need my flashlight. Are we ready? Here we go. Helps if I have the horse spout in the right place. And, whoa. whoa. You know, I really think the pink did a better job. That's amazing. And lights, Bob. Now, this is something super easy that we can do at home. Takes a few simple ingredients. We've got baking soda. We've got vinegar. Paint from the craft store. And you can make your own erupting pumpkins. Now, something I've done in the past that I didn't do this time, but it's really cool, is you can totally carve out a face on your pumpkin and do the same experiment, except this time, all of the bubbles made by our chemical reaction of mixing vinegar and baking soda, which releases carbon dioxide. <gasps> Didn't we learn about that already today? When it's frozen, it turns into dry ice. It comes out the mouth and the eyes, and it's super, super duper amazing. So we thank you guys for joining us for Spooktacular this year. Next year, we hope to see you right here in person, and everybody have a good night. Good night. Time to say goodbye. Thank you for joining us at Spooktacular. See you next year.